In this part of the course, we will play with data. You know the basic of the resilience and efficiency, as uh, Rachel and Ellie told this morning. And now, in this session, we have three sets of data. The, the daily ship data, uh, we will play with that. And mid ship, I think for the second part, there are two uh, different experiments. One will be presented by Flavi and the, the other by Nicola. And okay, I think we, you will have the opportunity to analyze. In this case, we have a tutorial that is really easy to follow. We assume that you have R or R Studio in, in your computers. And for the others, you will have an script, but with less help, then you, are, you have some practice you could go further and so on. Then we will play with efficiency and I will present our experiment. We work in daily ship. We have a replacement use for ASAF. ASAF is a breed that is originary from Israel, but we have a lot in Spain. And in our experiment, we, we take uh, use and during the growing, uh, growing period, we divide into groups. We have a total of uh, 40, 20 were uh, under the normal uh, nutritional uh, diet, the normal animals, and the other have a challenge with a reduction in around 45% of uh, less protein. Then there is a nutritional challenge in this case. Once this challenge is around two months and a half, I think, the animals were uh, merged again and they continue with a normal diet and follow the normal management procedures in a commercial farm in Spain with, uh, sorry, with artificial insemination and the lambing and during lactation we have a intensive experimental period, more or less the same as uh, Ellie defined during the, the evaluation period in growing animals, just to say that dairy animals and dairy uh, efficiency in dairy is much more complicated because in dairy the animals are growing, that's it. It's not so simple, but they are growing or fat. In, in, in the fattering period, okay, the same, they are uh, putting more fat. But dairy, the animals, we, we, they are producing milk and there are a lot of interaction with the body reserves. And okay, it's not so simple in this case. But anyway, we, we have this, these animals and we measure the milk gel. And in the complete experiment, there are some biomarkers and some molecular parts that are analyzed just to know a little bit better the feed efficiency, genetic or biological architecture in, in dairy sheep. But we will work just with a part. This is more or less the uh, global timetable for the first part of the year of this animal. This is the nutritional challenge that I showed you. And during lactation, in the first lactation, then the normalized lactation in ASAF is 150 days. There is one intensive experimental period that was planned for two months, more than two or three weeks of adaptation that was defined in the previous talk. And in this case, we estimate the, the feed efficiency index and the meal composition also that is necessary. And as I saw you, some, uh, some molecular uh, biomarkers. And just to say the complete story, these animals at the end of lactation were under an uh, inflammatory challenge, uh, just to see if there are difference between the more and less efficient animals or the uh, uh, nutritional challenge and, and normal animals. No? We are, are uh, uh, just to exploring the possibility of some epigenetic role in this in this uh, complex traits in feed efficiency and uh, response to to amastitis in this case. The period that you have is shorter. You have data reduces part of, of the data, and basically there are one 
during this part of the experiment, the animals are in individual cages, you will see. And they, are, they have three weeks of adaptation to the individual situation and to the uh, diet. And we have, these are the body weight and body condition score measurement at the beginning, at, at the end of the period in the day zero and 28. The dry matter intake is measured individually every day, the meal yield every day, and the meal composition more or less between two or one uh, every week. You, you have two times here, one time there, three around the half of the, this period, and uh, one the day 21 and 28 at the end. Then with these measurements, this, these are the animals. You see the individual case, but they need to, to be in contact with the others. We are working with SIPs, and SIP is a gregory the species. is not easy to, to manage individually. And you have, uh, uh, at the end, is the milking parlor is at the end of the, of the installation. And you see that the animals need the contact of the other. And it's necessary to have almost two weeks, but maybe three, to be adapted to the, this situation of, of experimental measurements. Uh, we see that at the beginning there is a, a small uh, down in the milk production, but maybe in 24 hours the, the normal production is recovered and uh, the animals start to be adapted. The data set that you will work have this extractor. In reality, we have 39. You have the animal ID or you have this, the identification of the animal. You have the group, if the animal is a control, is a nutritional challenge. The mean body weight, or the average body weight in the, during the, the period. The metabolic uh, uh, body weight change during the experiment. In this case, we, we have animals that doesn't change, animals that then have more weight, and animals that lose weight because they are mobilizing. This is the point that I, I see you before. Growing is more or less easy to parameterize. Uh, daily is a little bit more complicated. The total measurements have 31 days, but the 28 are the data that you will work with. This is the fat gel in milk, protein gel, the meal yield by day in kilos, the intake of the uh, TMR, the total mixed ratio, that this is uh, how we call the energy, is the same for all, of course, and the days in milk. You know that uh, we have on average the same, but uh, it's difficult in some cases to, to have a balanced uh, 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 group of animals with, uh, that have lambing in the same day, then we have a minimum of 23 in this uh, data and a maximum of 52, then it's necessary to know that uh, the animals follow more or less a lactation curve and it's not the expected production at the, uh, in, the, in day 23 than in day 52, then they are in the peak of lactation more or less. Then these are the data that you have and you will have, and we will work with three different indexes, in reality a total of five, but we, with two different ones, you will see, as I show you. The first, the first one, we call it feed efficiency index, and in reality is residual feed intake, but not residual, I mean, <laughs> the residual feed intake is uh, estimated in, in a linear model and you take the residual. This is working well when you have a lot of data. With 39, maybe it's not a good idea to make a residual, but you could estimate that. We call feed efficiency index, as I say you, but in reality it's uh, the same, and you will <laughs> verify it by, by yourself. Is the dry matter intake recorded, the real one that you have measured, minus the predicted one? Eli explained very well. In this case, the predicted, we will estimate with this ratio. Net energy 
requirements for maintenance, for meal production, from body weight chains. The animal have these three different things to, to do with the energy that is ingest. And in this case is the net energy of the ratio. The TMR is the ratio. And we have estimated following the inner equations from 2018. Then easy to, to see. The FCR is exactly the same, but taking into account that we don't have average daily gain here, where these animals are milking. Then feed intake, dry matter intake, and meal production, then we will use energy corrected milk, ECM, from now. Estimate it with this equation. You will estimate that, don't worry. And finally, the real residual feed intake. Okay. Conceptually, it's the same, the feed efficiency index, but there is a, if you want a, a estimation procedure, then you will uh, go in the other way. You will have data that are in, in your data set, but you will need new data, new parameters to estimate the, the residual fit intake. We have made three different RFI. Finally, in all the cases, you will have a model like this one. This is exactly the same than uh, the model of price from cattle, daily cattle. And you have the ECM, energy corrected milk. You have the metabolic body weight. And you have the interaction between body weight and metabody, uh, and body weight chains, no metabolic, body weight chains during the period. And you have a residual. OK, this is your index that you will estimate. We have another <coughs> model that was used in, in, in daily cattle also, but then changed the last part of the model, this is changes by the met interaction between metabolic body weight chains in, in, uh, in the period of the, of the test. You have the, the, these ticks are the, the parameters that you are using. And the last one is exactly the same, but the interaction between body weight and body weight chains during the period. Then, once you have, uh, uh, it's obvious that from the data, you, will, you need to estimate all these parameters. And you have here the GitHub link from Pablo, uh, where we put the, the data. And I think it's easy. Go ahead. I will show you. Do you have any question from the, the experiment? Daily animals. They change a little bit from the the, the global things. In this is the fit efficiency in as of use. You have the documents. Sorry. Uh, could you send us this uh, link or file? You have that. I don't know if they they have the presentation or not. I don't know. I will show you the, the address, it's not so complicated. <laughs> GitHub.com slash Pablo Bio slash fit efficiency underscore in Capitals Smarter 2023. You, uh, you, ah, OK. You have the link. It's seen by mail. You have received it. You, very, you, you try with your mail, you have the link. Wait. 
face, then, 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 then. Did you go to docks? You have the in data database is is in database. I don't remember exactly where is the ah okay. Here you have the data. <laughs> Sorry. But in database, yeah, the, you could copy and paste in a test if you want, in a test file. You see, you have the copy here. I think if, if there is problem to download, you touch copy and paste in a test editor, notepad or wherever. Yes. Yeah, this is the other option is to click and, and save. Is you go to the right and it's, it's unregistered and so here. And you, the best idea is to copy in the same folder where you are working in R. Import new libraries and define some general theme for the, uh, in, in R Studio it's, it's necessary to, to have the, the global uh, result, mainly graphics. In the next step, we are estimating the different index, the FEI, FCR, and RF, RFI. And in each case, you have an introduction and the command that we are using to estimate the different part. First, the metabolic body weight, the energy requirements for body weight chains. These are the units. The energy requirements for maintenance and with the mil gil, we estimate the energy in the mil gil, the, min <coughs> the fat gil, the protein gil, and the metabolic body weight. The change per day and the change for the complete experimental period. And then we estimate we don't have our, uh, average daily gain, we have ECM, energy corrected milk. We use the, this equation, and that is the calculus that we perform, the energy requirements for milk yield, the total energy requirements, and the predicted dry matter intake. These are the, all the parameters that are necessary with the data that we have uh, recorded. And you have a new structure of your database with the uh, until I think I's, until this point is the the parameters that we recorded and all these new columns are the calculus that you have performed on there. Now, from all this information, we have the definition of uh, fit efficiency index. Remember the recorders minus the predictor dry matter intake, and we plot it. This plot is just to see the range and how many animals we have in every point. We are not testing for normality and so on. Then it's just to see how our, our data are. And now we make a regression between uh, daily matter intake and feed efficiency index. You have the, or the different animals. The points and the value of the regression is almost zero. It's not correlated. The second index is the fit conversion ratio. You have also the definition. You have the, the 
new index that you are estimating. And here, you check for the distribution of the data. You have here, and hit the counts with between 1 and 4. And we, ha we have the same estimation, the correlation between uh, dry matter intake and FCR. In this case, it's minus 0.29. You see that there are different results than Ellie gives us for growth, but growth is growth and <laughs> milk and dairy is dairy. It's not the same process and we have different uh, correlation between these, these index. And finally, for the residual feed intake, just for play, we have used three different uh, uh, indexes. The first one is the classical one in dairy cattle that was defined by, by Jenny Price in uh, uh, 2015. And you have the, this is the formula in a linear model. And then you have here the coefficient, the intercept, and the values, the ECM, the metabolic body weight, the body weight change. Uh, uh, during the period and dry matter intake and from that you are estimating you have here the F statistics the p-value and the difference the this is important to have the adjusted and multiply r square then this value have almost 0.8 is the the regression of the on, of your uh, model did you have the uh, distribution of the values. You he here we have one animals that is real efficient. This one, remember, negative is are are more efficient, positive and less efficient. And you see, dry matter intake, unpredicted dry matter intake. You have here a very nice correlation with the. Uh, we don't have uh, make the the line, but you have the line. You will have the greens and dot, I think you, you present the green ones on the regression, the, the bad ones, and the green ones that are the good ones under the line. And this is the regression of the model. We use another different one than use, you have the model here. And in this case, you have the metabolic uh, body weight change and the metabolic uh, body weight. In this case, I think the regression is more or less the same, but a little bit worse. I think is yes, is uh, 66 before was 79 or something like that. But you have the same. This is the same animal, just for information, than the other, and this is the regression. It's not so so nice, but okay. You, we have the the data there, and finally, the third one, using an interaction between mean uh, body weight and body weight change during the period in the in the model is uh, real similar to the the RFI one as you will see and in this case we have uh, R square of uh, 77 a little bit lower but uh, no significantly lower and this is the regression that we have of the model Finally, we have estimated five different indexes. And here you have the distribution. In this case, you will see <laughs> properly, not just to, to verify. And you have the correlation between, in this case, uh, fit efficiency index, fecal, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, fit conversion ratio, and the three RFIs, the three models. You see, I, I saw you done the fit efficiency index. In reality, is a, a RFI without regression. And you could see that is the correlation is 81 and 83 with the first and third model and lower with this one. Okay? And then you have different alternatives. It's necessary to see what model explain better the, your, your case. In, in dairy, I say you done things are more complicated than, than in growing animals because uh, usually you have a mobilization of the 
reserve body reserve from the animals and most animals in, in, in during the period are losing weight or they're not and the, you must evaluate how important is that and how uh, the, or what model is explaining better your your data finally is we have the database including the fit efficiency index we have the animals we have the treatment and now the things that we are searching for the fit efficiency index uh, uh, fit conversion ratio and the three rfis the price the two and the three now we have defined it here you have the the data and just one extra thing we have put two extra just for fun the first one is this nutritional challenge was affecting feed efficiency and then we make an FTS just we compare variances just to see if the, the, the distribution are um, uh, with the same variance or, or no homo sedactic or heterosedactic is a, a awful word for almost for me then we see that we could uh, apply a t-test without problem the the, the the variance is is not different between the things and we see we make the test for uh, uh, fit efficiency <coughs> index fit conversion ratio and the three rfis the results are at the end the results then are more easily to explain you see green are the challenge animals, the nutritional challenge, and in red, the distribution of the, the controls. And in reality, there is no difference between nutritional challenge and, and control in this estimation. There are some outliers in some cases, and that's it. And finally, there is an additional comment regarding in the model to remove or not the intercept, because we have a, a funny discussion when we we're elaborating this, this data with the people uh, collaborating with us. They're saying, OK, but if you remove the intercept, <laughs> you have a higher <laughs> uh, uh, regression. And it's true. You see that it's 99. It's almost 1. <laughs> but it's not correct. There are some comments in this part. And it's, uh, please don't <laughs> do that, never. Because even if you have apparently better results, you are, you are tricking yourself. Then don't, don't do that. You will have the, the, this uh, tutorial available for you. Maybe it's the first time that you are using R or R Studio. It's a, it's a short time, but I think it's a good starting point just to know how to work with this kind of data. Do you have any question? I think we could move to Flavi experiment. Thank you. I'm going to present you a midship data set that we had at uh, InRay. So it, I will explain you how we collected the data, and then you will have the R script and the data files to play with. So first, the first look at our facilities. Uh, for small ruminants, we have two areas uh, where we can collect feed intake. We have uh, in south, so we are here in the blue point. In the right point, it's uh, Lafage. It's an experimental farm where we can collect individual feed intake in a dairy sheep in the Lacon breed. And we collect uh, individual feed intake with individual troughs. So in fact, uh, the, all the ewes are together in a pen, but they can eat only in one uh, trough. So they learn uh, which trough they can use, and they get feed only from the one they, they are allowed to, to go. The other experimental uh, farm is in Bourges, and here we can collect um, feed intake in uh, meat, sheep, and dairy goats. So this is a very new facility. We can collect uh, different uh, intakes. So we collect the water intake, we collect the concentrate intake, and even the forage intake. Uh, so this is a picture of a uh, very bad picture, sorry. Uh, of one pen. So we have 12 pens, and in each pen uh, there can be up to 20 or 22 animals depending on their body weight. And within one pen, for 20 individuals, we have one water 
device, one concentrate device, but we have three forage feeders uh, because, in fact, the animals spend more time uh, eating forage than uh, eating uh, concentrate or drinking water. That's why we have uh, three feeders. So this is the new facility from where we get our data uh, from now. But the data set I, uh, you're going to work with came from uh, an older experiment. Uh, we, had, we used to have older uh, feeders uh, at Inray. Uh, these are the, the gray ones. So in fact, these are so our old fashioned feeders. Uh, they were first designed for pig, and then they have been adapted for sheep. Uh, and we used them from the 1990s until uh, the last uh, two years. Uh, the way it's uh, delivering and recording the data is almost similar to the new ones. So in fact, each time an individual is uh, coming to, to eat, we record the day, the time uh, when it comes in and the time when it uh, goes out from the feeder. So for each visit, we have the duration and the quantity. So from this sort of data, you can do many, many analysis. Uh, so feed efficiency, as you will do, but also feeding behavior. Uh, and this, uh, with this data set, you will see that many other things can be done. For example, on Wednesday, uh, Andres Legara will uh, explain you some new models based on the same uh, data set. So this is our protocol. This is very close to the one Ellie presented this morning. Um, we, also, we have uh, two weeks of adaptation. So before this adaptation, we weigh the individuals and we allocate them uh, according to their body weight. So we have group of smaller uh, individuals and group of heavier individuals to avoid any competition uh, when they are going to, to eat. So after these two weeks of during these two weeks of adaptation, uh, sometimes we have to remove individuals because, for example, we check uh, the time during which they eat. And if uh, we see that we have visit during uh, 23 hours uh, a day, uh, it's too high. So we decrease the number of individuals to be sure that they are all fed uh, ad libitum. Then they are weighed um, twice, uh, one day apart, to have the body weight uh, at the start. Then they, have, they are fed with concentrate. Uh, in this data file, it's for eight weeks. Now we move to six weeks. So from six to eight, uh, there is no much difference than in the calculation. Uh, at the middle of the test, they are weighed again, and we perform back, fat, uh, back uh, ultrasound sorry, to have back fat thickness and muscle depth. And then at the end of the test, uh, there is a second uh, body weight. Yes? Uh, can you just re explain uh, why you remove some? So the lamb which we are eating uh, 23 hours a day? No, it's all the group of lambs that is eating 23. Okay. So when they are growing yeah, up, okay. they will eat more and they will spend more time. So they won't be at libitum okay. if at the beginning they are already at uh, 23 hours. But it's for the complete uh, set of animals. And you have the final body weight. So we have two measurements, one day apart, with a back fat, uh, back ultrasound. Sorry. So in fact, this protocol um, is the, exactly the same as the national protocol to, uh, to select on meat traits in our main uh, meat sheep breeds in France. Uh, the only thing which is new is the collection of uh, feed intake to perform feed efficiency. Uh, what we do is uh, for this uh, protocol, uh, and it is uh, the national um, requirement, we must phenotype at least 50 lambs uh, in the same uh, series of control. Uh, and you will see that even for residual feed intake, you need enough individuals to have a good uh, regression uh, to cal calculate the residual feed intake. So these are the data. Uh, you should receive the two files, I think. Uh, one uh, has uh, the performances. So you have one uh, row, uh, one individual per row. You have more than, uh, you have 951 animals that have been phenotyped from 2009 to 2016. Uh, so you have uh, fixed effects, 
So the first column. So the sex is males, but uh, you only have males, so it's no matter. Yes. Hey, uh, so I don't know. <coughs> Performance is two, yes, and uh, and visits for the and visits. And visits. Okay. These are the two files. So the first are a fixed effect. So the year, the pen. Here it's a fixed effect which is rearing. In fact, it's a sort of summary of what happens before uh, the the trial of a feed intake recording. So it's a combination of litter size, uh, the rearing mode, either artificial uh, suckling or maternal suckling, and uh, the number of reared, of, uh, reared per, uh, per you, if they are uh, fed uh, maternally. Then you have the body weight uh, at start, so at the beginning of the control and at the end of the control. You have the average daily gain over the eight weeks of control. And then you have muscle depth. the muscle depth at uh, the mid control and at the end of the control and similarly for back fat sickness and then you have the identification of the of the animal so this is for the performances and this is for the feeder uh, file uh, you so here you have one uh, visit on a, in a row in fact so in fact you have the day this is a sort of coding of the hour. Uh, you don't need that. This is a quantity in grams that has been ingested in that visit by this individual during this uh, number of seconds. OK, so this is the duration, the quantity. And this, uh, you, you don't care for this uh, trial. And this is the identity of the animal. So in the R uh, script, now that you are very familiar with R, you can uh, run it. And I will try to run it uh, in the meantime uh, to show you what you expect. I think that was the last slide. Um, hope you've still got a wee bit of energy in you to hear the, about the last data set. I won't go through it in too much detail. And we were going to do an exercise, but I'll maybe just kind of leave the data with you to, to run through that in your own time. Um, it's similar to what Flavi was talking through in terms of predicting the residual feed intake. Um, so this data set is another data set from Meat Sheep. Um, this was collected as part of the Grass to Gas project, which is associated with the Smarter project. Um, so the Smarter projects use some of the data from this. So it's just a smaller data set that we have. So it was across two years, um, collected in 2001, 2002, and it was using crossbred lambs. So there were Texel cross Scotch mule, which is a, um, a blue face Leicester cross Scottish black face. So it was a three-way cross. Um, we had data on feed intake from about 240 lambs across the, the two years. Our data set had females and castrated male lambs together in the data set that had been tested together in the one batch. They were sired by performance recorded Texel sires with a range of EBVs and they were fed uh, on grass nuts only. So um, you can see the picture down the bottom here. So it was pelleted um, nuts that they were eating and they were just on, on sawdust. So that was their only food source. And we were lucky enough, as Ellie mentioned, to have a CT scanner. So as well as doing the ultrasound um, measures of back fat thickness and muscle depth, we had um, CT measurements. So this is the lambs going through the CT scanner here, and this is the sort of image we get. And we have um, equations to calculate total uh, carcass fat and muscle from these scans. So that's what we're interested in for the RFI calculations because some of the early work with sheep in particular had suggested that maybe the change that you can see in uh, body composition through ultrasound over that six week period that we're testing them is maybe not, you don't see a big enough change in body composition across that six week period when we're measuring it by ultrasound. So we wanted to test CT scanning where you can get a much more accurate prediction of total body fat and muscle. And we're also measuring uh, room and volumes with the CT um, as a methane predictor as part of that wider project. 
So we took weekly live weights and we took feed quality measurements from each of the different bags of grass nuts that we use, so the, the big ton bag. So that was about every four or five days we had a new bag that we, we got feed analysis done on. So we had about 120 um, lambs per year and they were in just one big open pen. So unlike the system that Flavi described um, and the one that Ellie described this morning, all of our lambs had access to all the, the feed bins here. So we have 16 feed bins and there was one big shed with, um, so each of the lambs could access any of the, the feed bins at any time. And we kept them topped up with the grass nuts. So it was ad lib feed that they were being offered. Um, so again, we had the same setup as Elliot mentioned this morning. So we had two weeks training and adaptation and then a six week test period. And the system we have is a um, Norwegian company, Biocontrol, that designed the, the feed bins and they produce the software as well. So this is what we see for each visit that every time the lamb comes in, you get a record with uh, similar to what you saw on Flavi's visits um, data set, where you see the start and end time, the gate that they were feeding at and the duration of the feeding bout. And then we get the, the amount of feed eaten. And there's some other columns further along, which gives you a check on um, the amount that's left in the feed bin and how that compares to the amount that was in the feed when in the previous animal left, which lets you pick up on any errors that are in there when you're doing your data editing. So we do quite a lot of manual data editing at the end, and I don't think we've really discussed this much today, um, but in the first year we had uh, 145,500 records that were collected over the 42 days from approximately 110 lambs that went through the, the full uh, recording period. And in the second year, we had a bit more, about 156,500 records, and we recorded one more day because we had an issue with the, the bins on one day. But we wanted to take out the rubbish from that data set, um, which has been a bit of a trial and error process, looking back at um, our calibration trials to try to find out the best rules for editing our data. So if we look at the graph here, the, the red lines were the daily dry matter intake values for one lamb across the 42 day period. So you can see on one day it was recording over 25 kilo intake, um, which was obviously wrong. And what we noticed was that there's, there are issues where um, if lambs, some lambs were jumping into the feed bin and then other ones jumping in behind them. So we had to try and kind of weed out some of the, the nonsense data. So we um, devised a set of rules, uh, which took a, a bit of toing and froing, but we eventually come up with these rules that we apply to each of our data sets. And the um, number of records are in or the proportion of records in which this rule was relevant are in brackets afterwards. So there's a lot of these records where um, giving a zero for the visit duration or the amount of feed eaten. So they were just reading the tags, but they weren't actually um, eating any uh, feed. They must have been breaking. There's a laser beam they have to break to, to uh, record a record. So taking those out, we also then had some um, to do with how much they were eating or how quickly they were eating that we used to, to take out the, the wrong data. And uh, although some, some of that is quite subjective, so, so um, yeah, it took us a while to, to finalise those rules. And then we came up with um, a kind of edited data set for each lamb, which we see in green for the same lamb that, that I showed you before. There's also some lambs that we have to remove from the analysis um, because of interventions during the, the recording period. So a few were um, ill or poor recorded as, as being that over a period of time that could have affected their intake. And there was also a few that were ruled out because of their behavior. So badly behaved lambs that jumped into the bins and you got uh, records that, that weren't believable. So we took a few lambs out the data set completely. 
So the next step was to correct the fresh intake records for dry matter content of each of the feed bags uh, that Ellie mentioned this morning so that we get a dry matter intake per day. And then the way we um, deal with the data over the period for both the, the dry matter intake and the weight data is to fit regressions through the daily records and the weekly records and then remove any uh, values which are um, too far away from, from that regression. So for the dry matter intake values, we remove values that were over two standard deviations from the predicted regression line for that individual animal. And we average the remaining values to give us our average daily dry matter intake. And then we did a similar thing with the weights. So we took out any weights that were too far away from the regression line, which may have been errors on that day of weighing. Um, to calculate our mid-test metabolic live weight. So that was at day 21, we took the live weight to the power of 0.75. So this is a data set that um, you got from me, which I think was just attached to Ricardo's email. And so it's similar to what Flavi showed to so some columns that relate to the animal information, like the ID, the sex, because we had males and females, the year, litter size born, litter size reared, and the age at the start of the trial. And then we've got some live weights at the start and end, the mid-test metabolic live weight and an average daily gain. And then we've got some ultrasound fat and muscle measurements. So we took the ultrasound measurements at the start and the end of the trial, so S and E here. And we also looked at um, fat change, uh, so which is just the difference between the two of them. And we took ultrasound muscle depths at the start and end and the change in them as well. And then we did a similar thing for CT measured um, carcass fat and muscle. So looking at the start and the end and the change in those two measurements. And at the end there we have the average daily dry matter intake. So unlike Flavi's data set where um, our script was calculating the average daily dry matter intake, this data set's kind of just starting at the next step. Um, so I've just given you our, the cleaned, um, finalized average daily dry matter intake for each lamb to relate to these other things in our RFI calculations. So the aim was um, to take this data set and come up with the, the best explanatory model for average daily dry matter intake to be able to predict residual feed intake for each of these lambs. So there's these various things in the data set that we might want to include or not within that um, prediction equation to get the best goodness of fit statistics. So looking at some of the, the um, metrics that Flavi mentioned, like adjusted R squared or, or RMSE to, to give us the best um, fit of the multiple linear regression model. So the aim was for, for you to have a play with the data, but I think we're maybe a bit short of time, Ricardo. Should I just skip to the next yeah, step? Yeah, so I'll maybe just show um, that if people want to have a look at that in their own time, they can come up with some prediction models. This is the where I got to when I was playing with the data set. Um, so this was the, the kind of most informative model that, that I had, the things with the ticker, the things that were included in the model. But... Even the best model only came to an R-squared value of 0 0.32, whereas from what um, Ellie and Flavi and Juan Jose were saying before um, for meat and uh, dairy sheep, in the literature, the estimates are more up around 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, um, which is something that I'd quite like feedback on if anyone thinks of any reasons why our data set might be different. Some of the, the reasons that I've included here that they were were analyzing both sexes together, but even when we include sex in the prediction equation, um, it still doesn't increase the R squared value. It may be something to do with the, the breed cross of the animals we're using. As I said, there's three different breeds in that cross, so that might 
disrupt that relationship between feed intake growth and carcass composition. Also, whether we're comparing at the same stage of growth as previous trials, something to do with the environment. Um, the two summers that we measured were particularly hot for Scotland, which isn't particularly hot for a lot of other countries, but the lambs on the trial wouldn't be used to that sort of heat, so whether that was affecting that um, relationship as well. And that's something we were talking about earlier. Should we be including some sort of... Um, environmental data in these calculations as well, particularly if we're looking across a number of years or by accounting for year, are we, are we taking that into account anyway? Um, I did wonder as well if this lower R squared is due to the edits that we're applying to the data, so these cleaning rules that I showed you before, but we have tried it with various different edits, more or less, and uh, the R squared values are pretty much the same. Um, so I, I don't think it is to do with that. So it may be something to do with the, the system that we are using, so both the technology and the, the setup that we've got. So we're just using one big um, group and ad lib um, feed that's sitting in a bin so it's not like some of the other systems like the one that Flavi showed where the feed drops down for the animals um, so it's just like uh, big bins with about 30 kilos of grass nuts in them at most times. So there is a bit of spillage we know that although I don't think it would account for, for the differences we see um, and uh, there's, we can't rely that it's something to do with the reading of the tags so even though we've done calibration trials when we first got the system it's at some point you just have to trust that what you're getting in these records is is right so so yeah i think that's all i wanted to say so if anybody wants to have a play with the data they can get back to me if they can think of any reasons why my r, r squareds aren't very good or well not as high as other people's Any questions or anything else at the moment? No? <laughs> Feel free to clap. <laughs> okay. I was wondering, you were saying about the lower heritability. I was wondering whether it had anything to do with the length of the period of measure. Whether there's any relationship between how long you make the RFI measurement and Obviously, the error involved, the yeah. longer it is, I'm guessing. I mean, it is the same. So the six-week measurement period is the same that's been done in most other trials. So I think in France, New Zealand, Uruguay, it's all about the same, but they're seeing higher uh, R-squared values. So, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Did you say that the animals were crosses of three weeks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that I, I was saying at lunch to Nick was that we've had entire males in this system as well, a different data set, and we see about the same R squared value. But when you watch them in the pen, they spend their whole time chasing each other, jumping on each other, fighting. That that relationship between live weight gain or growth and daily feed intake must be affected by these sorts of behaviours as well. So I, I, I'm kind of surprised that you see as high a relationship as 0.8 in, in most systems, but it may be something to do with smaller pens or more weeding out of the, the bullying animals that Ellie spoke about as well. <laughs>